thing was we would always be in the Colosseum together, but in a different cause, but that was the exception rather than the rule. Tom founded EDF's West Coast office in 1971. We probably all know some of his more recent achievements just because the memory has to be shorter. But let's recall that among his landmarks was the very first published decision under CEQA, the 1972 case of <clears throat> Coastside County Water District, is EDF versus Coastside County Water District, in which the Water District tried to pass off a 20-page staff report as an environmental impact report. This decision preceded Mammoth by two months and was the one CEQA case that the Mammoth Court could rely on. <clears throat> in 1974, Tom served on Jerry Brown's uh, transition team which of course uh, helped create what was probably the, not probably, was the most environmentally conscious gubernatorial administration in recent California history. Tom was a major part of forming the team that served in Jerry Brown's administration. In 1975, his case of EDF versus East Bay Mud attained its first published decision. Uh, this was really the foundation of our modern water law in California, taking Article 10, Section 2, which had been enacted and which had been deemed to be a pro-development measure and converting it into an environmental mandate to the point where, as Art Baggett will remember, in the not so recent past QSA proceeding, one of California's water lawyers argued that Article 10, Section 2 only protected the environment and did not protect private development showing how Tom had completely rewritten the law to, if, if you will, throw out of our consciousness the origins of that mandate. Jerry put Tom on the Colorado River Board of California, an experiment you might imagine that not too many governors have repeated since. But out of that experience, one of Tom's great legacies with Zach Willey was his article in the early 1980s arguing that the solution to Southern California's water woes and a substitute for the Auburn Dam would be to conserve water in the Imperial Valley and transfer that to the urban metropolitan plain. All that has followed on the Colorado since is of Tom's origin. In 1976, when the California Energy Commission held its first proceeding uh, to establish the forecasting for California utilities, the very first lawyer to appear and call the very first witness was Tom Graff. I know I was privileged to be in the room at that point, and Tom laid the foundation for the notion that we do not need to build power plants every 20 miles up the California coast because conservation is the preferred alternative. And we all know, of course, that the utilities not only accepted but came to enthusiastically embrace what started out in that hearing room in the resources building uh, a, a generation ago. And then finally, we cannot uh, ignore Tom's two great legacies in the field of water resources and air quality management. Perhaps his landmark achievement, the 1992 Central Valley Project Improvement Act, in which from bill sponsors, uh, Senator Bill Bradley he received his ultimate uh, tribute. When asked whether he had ever shot three throws with Tom, and Tom prided himself in his record of consecutive three throws, <coughs> Senator Bradley said, no way, what would I say if I lost? For those who are too young to remember, Bill Bradley was a professional basketball <laughs> player for the, profession, <laughs> for the New York Knicks. And finally, of course, Assembly Bill 32, and just the wonderful picture of Tom uh, standing front and center behind the governor when that measure uh, was signed. Uh, this morning, by way of a last preparation, I thumbed through our casebook of Sachs, Thompson, Leshy, and Abrams on water resources law. It's a book about 1,000 pages long. 50 of those pages are dedicated to matters that Tom originated and perfected. And I don't think there is any other individual in the history of the water law of the West who could make, lay claim to that greater proportion of our current casebook. 
But in closing, I don't want to focus so much on the achievements, but just the personal memories of that first meeting with Tom on Knob Hill at his elegant apartment that none of us could afford today. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, after the 1980 Boston Marathon that we both had run, Tom in his capacity that year as a lecturer at Harvard Law School, and numerous breakfasts at the Rock Ridge Cafe where we were either collaborating or commiserating. <clears throat> Tom did not share my passion for historic preservation, but I think that table where Tom would periodically hold court with people from around the state probably deserves an historic landmark designation from the city of Oakland. I have often wondered, if Tom were with us, what he would have thought of Judge Candy's decision in the QSA case, which of course had its origins in Tom's reform of the Colorado River. Or what he would have thought of the legislation uh, that he could not take an active role in uh, that we are going to be spending our time on today. You know, as a Red Sox fan, if I can close on that theme, back in 2004, we borrowed from the fundamentalists, and we had a saying, WWJDD, what would Johnny Damon do? That's because Johnny Damon kind of looked a lot like the character from whom that initial derived. But I would suggest for today's conference, uh, in addressing our future of California water, recognizing that our community is so close and that there are no enemies, only collaborators in different ways. WWTGD, what would Tom Graff do? Let's have a great day in his memory. Thank you. David Sandino employed as the chief counsel for the California Department of Water Resources, and he's also currently my water law professor, so I know I need to be pretty careful about what I say right now. <laughs> Appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2007, David manages 32 attorneys and works for the department on water, environmental, and energy issues. We wanted to start off the symposium today by giving everyone kind of a level foundation to start off with, and Professor Sandino kindly agreed to set the stage for us with, a, with uh, he's going to do a landscape for us, an introduction to California water governance. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Susan, for that, that nice introduction, and also thanks to you and the rest of the students for such a well-organized conference. I'd like you to bring you and the rest of your team to my office and help me organize my office. <laughs> In fact, better yet, I'd like to bring you to Sacramento and see if you can organize state government, because I mean, things are really working well, so I appreciate that. Um, well, I'm going to try to give an overview of uh, California water issues. 20 minutes, so let's see if I can do it. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit, some of my presentation, a little bit about the water landscape. I'm going to preview a little bit for today's conference, which uh, you can look at in the agenda. It's very robust. And my presentation is aimed for folks that are new to water. I see a lot of colleagues and friends in the audience. In fact, sometimes they're one and the same. But there's a lot of new people here that haven't been exposed to California water issues before, and I want to talk to them. So for you experienced old-time water hands, if you want, go get a cappuccino, go to the beaches that way, come back in, in 20 minutes. But you're welcome to stay, too. So uh, first of all, you know, how do we manage water in California? Well, I was thinking about it, and, and it, it, here's, how, here how it, here's how it's managed to me. It reminds me a little bit of late night television. It's quite a spectacle. It's always entertaining. We just don't know who's in charge and at what time slot. So, <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit too, and, and Susan mentioned this in the introduction, that water is a juicy, important issue, no, no doubt about it. The dean said the same thing. But I want to prove it to you. I want to prove it to you 
The Economist, one of the uh, leading uh, magazines on current events and news, politics, etc. One every week has a special section that it devotes to an issue of the day. And usually it's on nuclear proliferation or the Middle East or what have you. But a couple months ago, it decided to devote an entire section to California water, the California water crisis. Also, last week or a couple weeks ago, you may have seen a 60 Minutes, and it could cover anything it wants to cover, decided to spend a 20 minute segment on the California water crisis and interview <laughs> Governor Schwarzenegger. And as uh, we've already heard, uh, the California legislature and the governor worked very hard to pass legislative session and devoted a considerable amount of time to pass the, uh, the water legislation. Uh, I compare it to health care on the national level. It's that important in California. And then, in real time, just this past week, the National Academy of Science, the premier group of scientists in the United States, met at UC Davis to discuss some of the Delta problems. They can, they can take their time and work on anything they want. They chose to work on California water. So hopefully I convinced you that you're at the right place. This is a big issue in the right time. Now, what I want to cover in the, the next 10 minutes or so are some of the issues that are driving California water. This is not a comprehensive ish, uh, comprehensive list. There's other things as well. But here's my shot to give you a quick thumbnail view. We're going to talk about hydrology, lifestyle, residence, infrastructure, regional approaches, water demands, population growth, climate change, and then and governance, the topic of this conference today. So uh, first of all, hydrology and residence. This is a slide, I think, that has some import um, I think it's amazing when you think about it that two-thirds of the water supply falls in Northern California, and I'll include San Francisco in that, but two-thirds of the population lives in Southern California. So we have a mismatch, and this is one of the choices that we make as California residents, that where we want to live is not necessarily where the water falls. And then the other thing that adds to the spice of California water issues is that the hydrology doesn't stay the same by hydrology, how much rain we have snow we have. It changes from year to year, season to season, region to region. And that causes challenges in terms of water management. Let me show you the next slide. Here's an example of water variability. And what we have is sort of this colored graph that shows uh, the amount of rainfall in inches that fall in California. And depending on what part of the state you live in uh, will depend largely on whether or not you have plentiful rainfall. Northern California, high precipitation areas, but as you slowly go south, uh, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley, and then into the south and eastern part of California, the rain starts decreasing. <laughs> Making it difficult to manage our, our population, our agriculture, with this variable rainfall. Um, here's another graph that may be of interest to you. This is the combined delta outflow. This is the combined flow of the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. Sacramento River here, San Joaquin River here. They meet in the Delta area. They combine. The water eventually flows into the bay and out the Golden Gate. Um, this bar graph, you don't need to see the numbers, but you get a feel that the total amount varies from year, uh, year to year. In a very wet year, my guess is I can't see it. That's 83. Uh, a lot of rain, a lot of outflow. But in other years, not so much rain, making it harder to manage. OK, uh, let me just give you an update, give you some real-time news about the current water conditions in the state. Um, if you've been tracking this at all, the last three years have been, been very difficult for the state and helped cause this California water crisis that the economists and 60 Minutes deem so important. Uh, in fact, on December 1st, uh, just a couple months ago, the uh, uh, state water project, the largest state-operated water facility in the U.S., announced that its delivery projections for 2010 only going to be 5% of the amounts. Now, this is early in the season. If things rain, we can improve that prediction as things go on. And we've been very happy over the last week or two as rainfall has increased. But uh, although it has rained over the past couple weeks or the past month, we still are in a drought. That's how our water managers are viewing it. We're not out of the woods yet. We need it to rain in February. We need it to rain in March. Uh, Lake Oroville, for instance, and this is real-time information, is only filled up to about 50% of average. We're still below where we'd like to be about 50%. So let's keep our fingers crossed and hope it rains. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Let me tell you a little bit about the infrastructure that allows us to manage this changing hydrology 
I think this is one of the most amazing maps uh, that you can uh, take a quick look at in terms of describing how much human beings have altered the environment and their water supply structure to meet the demands <laughs> of folks that want to live where the water doesn't fall. And if you look on this map, it's probably hard to see from a distance, but in general, what it does, it describes all the major water facilities in California. The dams, the aqueducts that allow us to manage the water supply and move it around the state. And we have both in California state and federal projects and also local projects that help us meet water supply demands. The large federal project, and that's the one in blue, is the Central Valley Project. Reclamation project. It's under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Reclamation. Some of its major features include Shasta Dam to the north. If you drive along Highway 5, you can't miss it. Uh, there's also near Sacramento Folsom and a couple other large Central Valley Project dams that are part of their system. Uh, the federal government, the Central Valley Project, it supplies water to agricultural interests in the Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley and also to urban interests in the Bay Area. Uh, another large water project was the one that I mentioned under state jurisdiction. This is in red. This is a state water project. It's uh, operated by the department for which I work. Uh, its large reservoir is Oroville Reservoir in Butte County. And it also uh, 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 delivers water to the San Joaquin Valley, but also delivers water to Southern California coastal <laughs> areas in the Bay Area. The state water project has been reported to supply water to about 25 million of California's residents. And then there's local projects, and uh, I can talk a lot about them, but I'm gonna highlight one of uh, the ones that probably of most interest in this group, and that's the project under the jurisdiction of the city of San Francisco, Hetch Hetchy project that takes water from uh, the eastern parts, of, I'm sorry, from the Sierra Nevadas, and takes water across the Central Valley into the city of San Francisco. If the city of San Francisco had to manage only on its local water supply, you wouldn't see the city that you see today. Because of water that's brought in from the Sierras into the city of San Francisco, we're, allowed, we're able to manage the population that we have here. So in a nutshell, because of this water infrastructure, uh, we're able to live in places and grow things that probably couldn't do it without it. So move on now to some regional issues. Um, <laughs> Each California region has its own unique water issues, its own unique challenges, and sometimes its own unique governance structure. Uh, I want to focus on one region briefly because you're going to hear a lot about it today, and that's the Sac Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Put this in perspective, uh, we're over here in San Francisco. The Delta is just to the east. In, in fact, let me raise, have you raise your hand. Who's been to the Delta before? Wow, okay. I can see this is an experience group. If you haven't been to the Delta, you must, you must uh, back tomorrow if you can. So uh, uh, the Delta is, uh, is, is a region that has, uh, as I mentioned previously, provides water to 25, Cal uh, 25 million Californians, but it's much more, it's much more. The Delta is, is a region where we have the convergence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River. Um, it provides a lot of California's average runoff two-thirds of California's water consumption, and it also within the Delta has these rich, vibrant Delta communities, uh, so-called legacy communities. There's, it's a large agricultural region. The Delta is the home to uh, fish and wildlife resources. It's also the home from endangered, some endangered fish, and it's heavy uh, uh, and well-known for its recreational uses as well. So you'll hear a lot about the Delta today. Uh, let me talk a little bit about California's water supply. And why we are always challenged here in California. On average, our total supply from all these projects, uh, uh, surface water, groundwater, is about 120 <laughs> million acre feet. It varies. But what we've discovered in our water balance is that when we're in dry years, there's insufficient water supply to meet our total demand. This is demand for agriculture, for urban users, for the environment. So what we have to do in times of drought, like we've had these last three years, is try to juggle this insufficient supply. And we do that through demand reductions, conservation, through water transfers, but also groundwater overdraft, which has its own set of environmental issues. And the number is substantial. It's, it's eye-popping. Sometimes the overdraft has been reported to be 2 million acre feet. 
Um, if you want more details, I encourage you to go to the DWR website. We have an entire water plan. In fact, the uh, program manager for this plan is here. Maybe you can talk to him a little bit during the break, and you can get everything you want to know about the California water balance. Um, I wanted to uh, also point out that uh, in terms of water use in California, there, has, uh, there is legal requirements that water be uh, dedicated to environmental uses. I have some examples here of environmental water, water dedicated to in-stream water for wild and scenic rivers, water for the San Francisco, uh, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta, and water dedicated to endangered species protection. I just want to talk about that for a second because this was uh, part of the subject of the uh, National Academy of Science. And uh, one of the residents fish in the Delta is the Delta smelt. Here's a picture of it. The Delta smelt is protected under both the federal and state endangered species laws. And in order to protect that fish and to have these water projects operate, uh, both the federal government and the state government has to comply with the federal endangered species laws. And they do this through a, a process called biological opinions. And these biological <laughs> opinions are created to protect these, uh, uh, these listed fish that Delta smelt, so they're avoiding jeopardy, avoiding their extinction, also to improve their habitat and improve their population. And as a result of this project process, both these water projects, the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, are permitted to uh, go forward with their water operations, provided they comply with the terms of the biological opinion. But here's where the rub has come, and the rub is as a result of conditions in the biological opinion, that the supplies by the State Water Project and Central Valley Project uh, were impacted by the conditions. Uh, some of the estimates say that the water supply impacts are up to 30%, depending on the hydrology and fish presence. So what we have is a tension here, and it illustrates the challenge in California water, that water that is used to protect the environment sometimes affects then water that would be delivered to agriculture and urban users. So, um, Another challenge that we're facing in, in California besides that balance is what are we going to do with all the new people? I think this is a stunning statistic to me that our ability to manage California's water supply, meet environmental needs, meet uh, urban needs was a lot easier in 1970 when we had 10 million. <coughs> look where we are today, 38 million. And look where we're going by some of the estimates, 42 million, 60 million. All these folks will demand a water supply and it challenges water suppliers to try to meet that need, either to develop a new supply, water conservation, whatever the solution may be. Uh, I'm also, uh, I'm having trouble here, sorry. Come on, quick, here we go. Um, wanted to point another challenge in, in the California water landscape that we're dealing with, and this is climate change. And I think this is also another stunning graphic. When folks uh, drive to Tahoe and enjoy the snowpack, they don't realize a lot of times what they're seeing is our natural reservoir system. We have water that's stored in our concrete reservoirs that I mentioned before, Shasta, Oroville, but also the snowpack so, uh, serves as a great storage for the state of California to allow water to move. Um, well, what we're discovering as a result of climate change, that this snowpack is decreasing, and we're expecting that as the climate change issue becomes more severe and temperatures increase, that the amount of the snowpack that we have will also decrease. We're estimating that as a result of the increase in temperature, depending on what model you look at, that we're going to lose potentially four to five million acre feet of water supply in California 60, 70, 80 years down the road as a result of climate change. This will further stress a system that doesn't have enough water now, let alone as we reduce so uh, now we'll get to the subject of today's topic a little bit, California governance. If you can understand this map, great. But I think it's, it was put in here for a purpose that, man, we have a real challenge here to figure out what goes on in governance. And uh, let me just tell you some of the agencies that are involved in governance. And this is not a complete list. This is not a complete list. So I could, I, could, I could put a couple slides, but for the sake of time, we have some of the major players up here. We have the federal government. I already mentioned Bureau of Reclamation that operates the Central Valley Project. But we have another federal agency in California, the Army Corps of Engineers, that operates its whole set of, uh, of reservoirs as well. I mentioned the biological opinions. They're under the control of federal wildlife agencies. State government, we have the State Water Resources Control Board, 
that regulates water rights among its many responsibilities. It regulates surface water rights. I mentioned the Department of Water Resources and its involvement in the state water project. There's others as well. And you're going to hear about the Delta Stewardship Council later on as part of the new legislation. A new player in California's government. <laughs> I, I can't omit local government agencies as well, cities, counties, local water agencies have a rich role to play in California water. Important stakeholders that are out there, customers, tribes, agricultural users, uh, water dedicated to energy, they all have something to say in California's governance scheme. And of course, Congress and, and the state legislature, they have a lot to say as well. And I can't omit the courts. Uh, some would argue right now that the most powerful person in California water today isn't the governor, isn't the Commissioner of Bureau of Reclamation. Instead, it's Judge Oliver Wanger in Fresno. Judge Oliver Wanger is hearing these cases regarding the Delta biological opinion, and he has a lot to say about the California water landscape. So, courts are doing as well. I'm gonna add my two cents, my two cents about the water legislation, and then I'll wrap it up here. Um, the uh, water legislation has had uh, a lot of attention. You have, uh, we have a panel devoted to it. And there's some differing views about whether or not the legislation really accomplished something. Uh, the dean taught, read from the Chronicle. I'm going to read from an even more esteemed paper, the Sacramento Bee. And I'm <laughs> don't laugh. Um, uh, and this was a column from Dan Walters. I'm sure many of you have read about Dan. Uh, Dan is the premier columnist. I enjoy reading his stuff. But he had this comment about, uh, about the water package. And he quoted Churchill here, or paraphrased Churchill. This is what Dan said about the water package. He said, never, well, that's what Churchill would have said. So I'll, I'll read it like that. Never in California's political history have so many politicians labored so long to produce so little. So <laughs> that's what, that's what uh, Dan thought about it. Um, but uh, there's some contrary views by Senator Steinberg. Senator Steinberg said, over the last several decades, Numerous efforts to comprehensively address the state water problems have consistently failed. This is a testament to the difficulty of the task. But the Senate this week rose to the occasion, overcoming numerous regional, philosophical, and political obstacles to forge an historic bipartisan compromise. Bipartisan compromise. Well, that's the, the subject today for, uh, for the panel, is who's right on this, and you'll be, have a chance to form your own opinion. I'm going to add my two cents. I can't resist since they have a minute left. Yeah, I actually, I actually think that the water package is a step forward, is an important accomplishment. And I think, uh, to quote uh, uh, Judge Roby, who was the uh, keynote speaker at last year's conference, that the history of California is written on its waters. And I think there was some history made last November when the package was passed. Just a little bit about the package. There's four key components hear more about it, but there's a governance component, there's a water conservation component, a groundwater monitoring component, water supply reliability funding component, which takes the form of a November $11.1 billion bond measure that we'll have the opportunity to, to vote on. And what, what do all these packages try to do? What is their theme? I'll tell you what their theme is. They want to try to improve water conservation. They want to improve regional supplies. There's some, there's some part of the package that is intended to improve our storage situation. And then you're going to hear a lot about this today. Try to fix the delta. Try to re redress these declining fish populations. At the same time, ensure water uh, supply reliability. And then make sure that we have sustainable investment measures for our water infrastructure. Well, I'll leave you with this last slide. Um, <laughs> I, I know this is a hot ticket, um, this water law conference, probably even more so than the USF Gonzaga game tonight, but uh, I'm looking for the Salahis. Maybe they're in the other room, but please stand up if you're out here. Thank you very much, and I'll look forward for your questions. Professor Sandino. This will be our next speaker. Stuart Drown has been the executive director of the Little Hoover Commission since May of 2006. 
The commission is an independent, citizen-run oversight body that uses public hearings and advisory committee meetings to develop recommendations to improve efficiency, transparency, and accountability in state government. How's that for a task? Currently, the commission has been holding hearings on California water governance. Mr. Drown, where are you? Oh, hi. I'm really, really grateful that you came here today and that you'll provide the perspective of the Little Hoover Commission on California's water governance. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. Um, the Commission has benefited tremendously from the work of the Water Symposium in the past, and to think that this is put together by law students and this is the class is just amazing. You heard a little bit about what the Commission uh, does. It's, the open process is very much part of uh, the... How's that? Okay. Um, Commission's made up of nine private citizens and four lawmakers. They're, they're all appointed by the legislature and the governor. Uh, they bring their own expertise, but the heart of the process is, is the open study process that we have. That is hearings. We've just finished our fourth hearing on uh, this water governance study. It's also uh, advisory committee meetings. Uh, we had one of those this week as well. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of um, interviewing by staff and by by the commissioners working with the staff. Uh, it, it can be a messy process. The advisory process is, is not aimed at getting uh, consensus. We've had lots of people say they'd like to be consultants to help us make it work better um, because they, they feel that it's chaos. But the, the, the goal there is to surface issues and to vet issues. And uh, the one we had just on Wednesday was on water transfers with some of the participants that were there here today. Um, although the commissioners have expertise in certain areas of the commission studies, uh, the commission relies on experts to help it develop its recommendations. And some of those experts here are in the room today, and I'd like to publicly express our appreciation for the valuable contributions they've made. This is truly a public service, and uh, it's very important. Uh, the commission focuses, work, focuses its work on, uh, on executive branch operations. Efficiency and organization. It, it, it does have an agenda, and the agenda is to improve outcomes of state programs. Uh, by statute, we're, we're given the, uh, the, the, the power to recommend, uh, which is, this is not much except that our, our audience is the legislature and the governor. They are our clients. Um, often, when we come up with our recommendations, they say, Who asked you? It's important, though, that when we look at this, we, we, we look at change, and we look at change as normal. We look at change as, as chaotic, but uh, in our experience, uh, over, since 1962, we've seen that the government is, is just not very well prepared for change, and that uh, decisions and processes and structures that were built for very good reasons at one time may have outlasted their usefulness and may not be able to, to uh, handle the challenges that recommend often um, reorganizations. Uh, we have recommended uh, the elimination of programs that no longer serve their purpose, consolidation, and, and certainly new ways to look at, at things. In this study, uh, we're looking specifically at structure, although policy is, is, is a large part of that. And um, as, as part of that, we, we look at a lot of the, 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 um, the pieces that out, but we're looking specifically at, at the state, the state components of that. Um, and, and we look through, when we look at governance, we look through the lenses of efficiency, transparency, and accountability. And as part of our analysis, we look at structure, laws, organizational cultures, leadership, uh, and the alignment of goals with outcomes, as, as well as funding and best practices around the country. Um, to go back agenda is to, to try to change the culture of California, the government culture, to a, an out outcomes-based culture, one where data is used to drive uh, decision-making. Uh, we, we 
looked at a lot of different things. We looked at public health, we looked at corrections, uh, we looked at education, um, we looked at mental health. And we had looked at water recently in the, in the past, twice in the last uh, past five years. And that's kind of what led us to this um, piece that we're looking at, at now, the, the water governance study. In, in, two, in general, the commission gets to choose the, the topics that it uh, studies. And that, that's an, a, a important prerogative that we, we guard very carefully. Otherwise, we'd be asked to do all kinds of things. But, but when the legislature or the, or the governor comes to us with a request, uh, it's something we give very careful when Governor Schwarzenegger uh, asked the commission to look at the CalFed governance system of the California Bay Delta Authority. And we, we came out with a report um, that, that examined kind of the, how CalFed had run out its string. And, and I think a lot of the, uh, the issues that we looked at there were, have remained germane and uh, fed into the, the discussion we had in 2009 uh, that has led to the uh, Delta Stewardship Council. Um, there, it was, it, we saw that it was a lack of leadership, or leadership did not uh, remain committed to, to the process, and also that the, the, uh, the body, the CalFed agreement, just did not have proven the authority that it needed to, uh, to carry out what it needed to get done. Um, so at that point, we stipulated the, the Delta has to be fixed. The Delta as it is is not sustainable. Um, so just hold that out there. Second report that uh, we chose to do that had to do with water looked at the uh, California Water Boards, the relationship between the state uh, water resources control board and the nine regional boards, and, and looked at how the state achieved water quality uh, and what hurdles were there and what issues there were in the relationship between or among the boards uh, that needed to be addressed. As part of that, we touched on, on water rights, or we became aware of how complex the water rights system. Survival instinct decision to not wrap that into our water quality report, but, but that was something that that the commission learned a lot about um, as part of that study. As we were coming into uh, the, the final stretch of that study, a lot of things were happening, and, and none of them were, were particularly good in terms of uh, the status quo in the Delta. And um, we had the fish crashes. Coast closed to fishing, salmon fishing again, uh, and we had a steady stream of rulings coming out of Judge Wayman's court. And uh, the commission, before it issued the water quality report, started you know wondering, boy, you know, the governance st structure of the state has not suddenly gelled to fix this problem. And uh, there was real concern that going forward. Uh, that water policy and water governance could very well be determined by the federal courts. And this is, this is a, a huge concern for the commission because of our experience in that court intervention is, is very often a sign of, of failed governance. And I, I think there's few people that are gonna stand up and, and say that our governance situation is, is, is working in terms of California water right now. Um, in our experience, I'm talking specifically about our Corrections, corrections experience and, and uh, examination of mental health, the, the solutions that come out of the courtroom, uh, despite the best efforts of a judge, may not meet the long-term needs of the state. And so uh, we're trying to, in this study, look at developing recommendations uh, to, to improve the governance structure to get to a, a long strategy that, that can meet the needs of a, of a growing population as well as our environmental obligations and, and be able to compete as well. Uh, and that, as most of the people know in this room, that, that has not been easy. So uh, the question is, who, who put us up to this study and the commission chose to do this study? Uh, in, 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 in scoping it, we, we, we made three key determinations. Number one, Delta has to be fixed. We're not going to make a policy call on how it's going to be fixed. We said in 2005 it's not sustainable. The commission has not changed its mind. Um, there, there obviously is, is room 
saw some vigorous discussion about uh, that fix, and certainly the November um, legislation has been an important step in, in, in creating the fix. Sure, if this works. Um, we also said we're not going to chunk the water rights system. Um, on top of that, we're also, and believe me, there's been plenty of people urging us to say, you know, this water rights system, it's crazy, you got to get rid of it. Well, it, it's just not something that the commission's liable to do, and anybody who's followed their work will understand that. The same token, uh, it, it's a flawed system. Okay, we get that. Uh, we're not going to chunk or recommend chunking the uh, Endangered Species Act. It, too, is a... Uh, flawed product, but it's, it, it represents the, the, the uh, very important uh, priorities that we give to, to the environment, and, and that's something that the state is going to have to work within and, and bolster. Um, I'm looking at my, my, my time in here, so I'm going to jump forward. Uh, the, the public process has, has had these four hearings. We, we just finished the last one on Thursday. Uh, I think uh, that to the commission's credit, uh, the, the process has become more difficult uh, in terms of, of trying to reach conclusions and, and make recommendations. Uh, you know, certain things, as you get information, tend to gel, and then as you get more information, uh, tend to look fuzzier. So. Uh, I, I can honestly say at this point, um, the commission has not come to its, its conclusions uh, or its recommendations. I mean, there's certainly pieces that, that we're looking at and heard a lot of testimony about, but uh, despite a lot of the conversations we've had with people in this room, uh, I, I'm not, things are still uh, quite up in the air. The, the last hearing that we had, uh, we had Betsy Rieke from the resources uh, a law fund foundation. We, we heard a lot about uh, the importance of the Delta Stewardship Council. Uh, we heard about the, uh, the importance of the interplay between uh, groundwater and surface water and, and the, the, uh, the implications in water transfers uh, for groundwater. Um, that's something, that's, that's a policy call. I think it'll inform our, our structural uh, decisions or structural recommendations. Um, some of the earlier testimony that we've heard has, has focused on the, on the projects, how the, the state project and the federal project can be worked, can, can be more closely aligned. Uh, the case has been made that uh, the state water project should be pulled out of DWR, and there's a list of uh, reasons why that seems like a good idea. We've also been interviewing lots of people that say that would create such chaos that uh, it would really damage the state. Um, from an efficiency standpoint, I think the commissioners early on said it's crazy to have two separate water projects, but they can't control that. We looked at why previous merger attempts failed, uh, and we heard a lot of testimony on, on the considerations uh, or obstacles to future mergers, but we also heard a lot about lots of opportunities to run those programs more closely together. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time learning about water rights, we spent a lot of time learning about the linkage between water rights and water quality. Uh, we're looking at some of the institutional structures there and, and ideas uh, from people in this room about how that process could be made more efficient, more transparent, more accountable, and, and speedier. Um, as, as we were going through our uh, process, the, 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 legislator, the legislation uh, started to gel for a, um, a whole huge package of reforms. And we kept a very close eye on that. And uh, there were lots of moving parts and pieces would appear and, and disappear uh, as that went forward. And, and, you know, up until, well, at least through the summer, there was a lot of concern that the, the budget crisis would push this off the map, and that, that was a, a very real concern. And, and just because of the difficult nature of uh, water politics in the state, uh, there was just never any guarantee right up until the end that, that something would happen. Um, you'll hear a lot more about the pieces of that, but 
the water legislation we feel is, is probably the most important uh, package of reforms that's come our way since the Porter Cologne Act. Uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that, um, that for the purposes of our study, this, this set of laws uh, will, will be a very important policy. Um, it'll set the policy direction for, for what can be accomplished at this time and, and what, what can be, uh, what should be the focus of attention in the future. Uh, it also had another benefit of it for us in terms of our client. It provided a, a very intense education for the lawmakers as to what's at stake. And I think that'll make our job a lot easier in, in, in discussing water rights, groundwater, um, the Delta Stewardship Council, the importance of the Delta Conservancy. Um, it'll help put our recommendations about structure in a, in a place that'll make sense to them and I, and I hope be persuasive to them. So with that, I'd like to, to finish up and invite Mr. Sandino up if, if you have any questions in the short time we have left. Yeah, come on up. How their legislation addresses agricultural use? Yes. Um, well, you know, we have spent a lot of time looking at at that piece and looking at the trade-offs uh, and examining kind of, you know, some of the myths around that. I, I think there's there's a, a large desire to uh, um, to believe that, that there are, are huge savings there strictly through conversation, uh, conservation. And I think there are savings there through conservation. But I think that if, if there's going to be changes in water use, that has to be done through a process. Uh, and I think most of the pieces of that process are there. I think you're going to be starting to talk about incentives and, and uh, other things that, that can make that work. I mean, we're looking at what structure is appropriate and could be robust enough to have that process. I mean, it is a huge water user, no question. There's going to be less water in the future. More water has to go towards environmental purposes. Urban wants water. So there has to be, uh, one of the big questions we have is, are we in a position to um, structurally to deal with the conflict that's coming our way? Do we, are, are, are our institutions uh, robust enough to, to, to process this conflict in a, in, a, in a fair, equitable, and expedient way? And I, I think that's a good question. Yeah, I, I would add that if I, had 20, if I had 21 minutes instead of 20 minutes, I would have made that point. But I didn't have that much time. But since you asked the question, sure, you point out uh, one of the, 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 the key issues or one of the key paradigms for California California water that agriculture uses the lion's share of it. If I had more time, I would have pointed out too how important agriculture is to the California economy. I'll also point out how lucky we are to live in a society where we can go out and have folks like myself that don't farm, yet I can go to a grocery store and, uh, and, and uh, pretty much buy what I want to buy. So I would, have, I would have emphasized that more. I also would have said, see, this is what I'm getting a chance to say this, I also would have talked about water transfers and how that's part of the solution to California's uh, water shortage and how uh, my department is heavily involved in dry years and moving water from willing agricultural sellers to urban users and to environmental users. So it's a big part of the package. I agree with you, your point completely. And, and to support David's work, I mean, that's what we spent a lot of time on Thursday and we have been looking at is how can you make the transfer process uh, more certain? How can you remove uh, risk? 
uh, how can how can you ensure that there's environmental protection as part of that? And and you know I got to tell you that's that's pretty complex. I think we're going to take one we're going to yeah. take one more question and then we have our So only Oroville is at 50% and the rest of the, the reservoirs are doing really well. Will that allow there to be more allocation of water for agriculture? The, the, agri the allocation is a complicated process, but uh, the water storage in some of these other reservoirs, uh, Central Valley Project reservoirs, that's a good sign. Uh, sign. I looked at Shasta, it was something like 60, 70 off the top of my head. Uh, so those are all positive things. Um, but the actual allocation, we won't know for sure until later in the year. We still have a couple more months of the winter season. And at that point, we'll get a better handle of what the snowpack really is and what our water supply situation is. And I hope you're right that we will be able to allocate more. I think uh, the department will raise its 5% allocation. I don't know what the number will be, but we're hoping that it goes up higher. And we'll know soon. So. You're right on to monitor those, and we just keep track of them. We're looking at them daily. It's also important to keep in mind on those allocations about you can have stranded assets, and a lot of that storage is now is a stranded asset. If you can't get it through the delta to a lot of the growers that need that water, it's great, but not great for those growers. I mean, so uh, you, know, you have to look at, at some of the, the constraints that are on the system right now that, that are complicating that whole equation. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to ask Professor Caswin to introduce our keynote today, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit about Professor Caswin, and I could give you the facts of her bio, that she's a frequent commentator on the topic of environmental law and justice and received her Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. But I'm fortunate enough to have had Professor Caswin as my environmental law professor, so I'm able to speak from personal experience about her. And I can tell you things that you won't find in a bio. And since my grades are already in, you'll know what I say to you is true right now. <laughs> Professor Caswin, she's thoughtful, she's bright, and she encourages her students. She was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to USF Law School. And one of the things about Professor Caswin is that she really, she challenges her students to excel and at the same time, she becomes a real friend along the way. So it's with great respect and admiration, admiration for you, Professor Caswin, that I ask you to come here to introduce the keynote today. Well, thank you, Susan. I can start off by blushing and stammering uh, with that introduction. So uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm also delighted to welcome you back to USF. Uh, and I think uh, in light of the time, I'll incorporate by reference um, the Dean's acknowledgement of the incredible and ongoing contribution of students in Bay Area law schools, uh, the faculty advisor from a wide range of Bay Area law schools, the sponsors who year after year uh, contribute to make this symposium an ongoing success. So, so I, uh, I just make a brief mention of that. Um, and I also think that we do owe um, a special thanks this year to Susan Gilbert Miller, um, I guess I get to get my revenge now by speaking, speaking a moment about, about her. Um, she's a second year law student. Um, and uh, working with her has been work, like working with a colleague, uh, uh, no different. Um, I've appreciated her professionalism, her insight, her foresight in both steering the substantive program this year as well as in working collaboratively and democratically with uh, the, our sister schools and with the USF staff, uh, who themselves have done so much um, to make this a successful event. But I'm here um, to introduce uh, Assembly Member Jared Huffman, who will be our keynote speaker today. Um, as the chair of the Assembly's Water Committee, he was one of the key players in developing, negotiating, and securing the passage of the Water 
uh, legislation that will be the focus at least of this morning's uh, discussion. Uh, he began uh, by convening hearings on the Delta crisis and in the spring of 2009 he co-chaired the bipartisan and bicameral legislative working group that uh, ultimately laid the foundation for the legislation. He helped author portions of it and he worked with Senator Daryl Steinberg uh, in some of the key negotiations with the stakeholders and the administration. Um, as many of you know, he's worked for years, not just in the last year, but for years to preserve uh, the environment and the California environment. And with this legislation, uh, he's worked to try to develop um, constructive solutions for California. So please join me in welcoming uh, Assembly Member Huffman. Thank you, Professor. It's uh, great to be here. I'm honored to be your keynote speaker today. And of course, welcome to San Francisco, which, uh, depending on which direction you're facing, is either the Golden Gateway to the Pacific uh, or the Gateway to the Delta. We're going to face east for purposes of my remarks and, and talk a lot about the Delta. And I want to start with some incredible good news. Uh, for everyone who's been frustrated by the Gordian knot of the Delta, the dysfunction of Delta governance with 200 plus agencies involved but no one in charge, the environmental death spiral for the largest and most important estuary on the coast of two Americas, the fisheries collapse that has led to the closure of a quarter billion dollar commercial fishing industry for two years in a row and quite possibly a third year coming, and the constant litigation and bickering among agencies and stakeholders, the declining quality and reliability of water supplies for the 23 million Californians that depend to some extent on the Delta, and of course the vulnerability to a Katrina-like disaster because of our lack of an emergency preparedness plan and a coherent levy maintenance strategy. For all of you who have wrestled with this Gordian knot, a miracle has happened. The California legislature has solved all the problems. <laughs> Anybody believe that? Uh, I didn't think so. Well. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, we did not make all the necessary decisions to uh, fix the Delta's failing ecosystem. We did not come up with some magical conveyance solution that's cheap and good for fish and improves reliability and insulated from the effects of climate change. Uh, we did not uh, do any of the, frankly, hard, heavy lifting that's going to be necessary in the years ahead. But we did make a lot of progress in this legislative package uh, last year. And uh, I would argue that um, without exaggeration, what we were able to accomplish last year, uh, if it's implemented right, is going to represent a very, very serious improvement over the status quo. It's going to be good for the Delta and the Delta's fisheries. And I think, I think uh, also bodes well for California water uh, in general for our future. So for the Delta, let's start there. Uh, one of the most important changes we made was the creation of a new governance and planning structure for the Delta. A new seven-member Delta Stewardship Council is going to develop a comprehensive Delta plan over the next two years. And that plan is going to be premised on a new concept, the co-equal goals of restoring the Delta's ecosystem and improving statewide water supply reliability. Now, on the ecosystem plan, I think one of the most important pieces of that is that it will be based on the recovery of key species instead of trying to avoid extinction one fish at a time. Uh, for the water supply plan, uh, I think an important piece of that is that it will look broadly at strategies that improve statewide water supply reliability. You'll note that the language of the co-equal goals is very carefully chosen. It speaks to California's water supply and not increased Delta exports. That's very, very significant. And you might, uh, and I want to point out that it's accompanied by a new express policy in the legislation that states that the policy of the state of California is to reduce dependence on the Delta for water supply. You might say that's pretty obvious that we need to do that, that considering how ecologically fragile the Delta is, all the evidence of the high pumping levels earlier this decade and the carrying capacity uh, limits of this estuary. Uh, you might say considering all of the vulnerability that this water export system has to interruptions, to storms, or even beavers and gophers, uh, you might say that uh, considering how energy intensive it is to export water from the Delta all the way to Southern California and how over-dependent some folks have become on this single source of water. You might say in light of all of these factors, 
It's rather obvious that we need to reduce dependence on the Delta. But in the face of all of those realities, um, some major players in California water have continued to push for increased Delta exports in recent years. And so it's very significant, I would argue, legally and as policy guidance that the legislature has for the first time codified a policy of reducing dependence on the Delta for water supply and achieving our water supply through strategies other than increased exports. Now, in terms of the authority of this new Delta Stewardship Council, when the plan is complete, the, the council will have the ability to decide whether the actions of state and local agencies are consistent with that plan. And the hope is that this new governance framework is going to bring a more cohesive, rational, and science-based approach to planning in the Delta, and that it will provide much more transparency and accountability for key decisions affecting the Delta. And beyond the Delta, the legislative package of 2009 um, I believe set a very hopeful new course for water management in the state of California. And starting with the area of ur urban water conservation, for the first time, our state has set a numeric target for urban water conservation, including uh, some very meaningful incentives to help us achieve a 20% per capita reduction in water use by the year 2020. In the area of agricultural water conservation, uh, we didn't ask nearly as much, but the baby steps that we were able to take and again, this is politics, this is the art of the possible, uh, are a first. We've never been able to ask anything of the agricultural sector in California in the area of water conservation. So for the first time, we're gonna require folks who irrigate more than 10,000 acres to develop agricultural water management plans. We're gonna require a few best practices. And we've put in place a framework for the development of numeric targets and best practices that I believe will eventually be required of agriculture. So, uh, we are on the path, I believe, uh, to beginning to realize the huge potential benefits of agricultural water conservation. But those who argue that these are mere baby steps, you're right. Uh, this, is, this is one of those issues where you could look at it either way. I choose to believe that it's a milestone that for the first time in our state's history we've been able to crack open the door uh, of this important issue. In the area of groundwater, another third rail uh, of California politics. Um, Think about the significance of groundwater. In a drought year like 2009, groundwater was probably at least 40% of our state's water supply. And yet, California remains the wild, wild west uh, in terms of this critical resource. We do not regulate it. We do not, in any consistent way, measure it or report it or manage it. Although some folks have put together very good local uh, groundwater management programs. I, I would like to tell you that we've changed all that in the legislation of 2009, but again, uh, what we've done is taken uh, a very important first step, but a small step. We're going to require that every major basin and sub-basin report groundwater elevations, and that data is gonna be publicly available. Um, I think everybody understands that at some point we're gonna have to go much, much further on the area of groundwater management and ultimately groundwater regulation, but this is a huge first step. Every prior attempt to get at this issue in a meaningful way has either died in the legislature or died on the governor's desk. On the area of water rights enforcement, uh, we have closed reporting loopholes. We have provided much better resources for the state water board to do its job in enforcing water rights, and we have provided some higher penalties. Uh, by the way, those resources, that's a 400% increase in the personnel that the state board now has to enforce water rights. Uh, unfortunately, we did not provide all the tools that the state board is going to need to do uh, a meaningful job at protecting legal users of water and the environment from water theft. Uh, but we're gonna keep working on that, and I'm gonna pledge to you that I'm gonna do everything I can, and I'm hopeful that we will finish the job of putting some, some important new enforcement tools uh, on the table for the State Board in 2010. And then finally, there's the investment piece of this uh, water package, and that is an $11.1 .1 billion general obligation bond. Now, there are pros and cons uh, to this water bond, and I suspect there uh, is a diversity of opinions uh, within this room. Certainly there uh, is a diversity of opinions uh, in the legislature about whether we should have included a general obligation bond at a time when California has the worst bond rating in the, the nation, at a time we, when we are frankly quite broke, uh, and also uh, a general obligation bond that includes many elements that frankly people like me didn't support. Uh, I 
am somewhat ambivalent about this bond. I, I fought for months to try to keep it out of this water package. But this was a compromise. And what I will say about the general obligation bond that you're going to see on the ballot in November is that everybody ought to seriously look at the pros and cons. I happen to be one who believes we're going to need a general obligation bond at some point for California water. I believe in the principle of beneficiary pays. I think we ought to use revenue bonds for infrastructure wherever possible. Uh, and that we've got to be very careful about racking up uh, more debt service burden on the general fund in the state of California. But at the same time, if you look at challenges like the Delta, where the public benefits, the ecosystem pieces, are going to require billions of dollars in public investments, there's really no other way uh, to pay for those things. When you look at things like the watershed restoration needs around the state and in places like the North Coast, when you look at the need for Klamath Dam removal, a $250 price tag, we've got no other way to really fund that, at some point we're going to need a general obligation bond. And if it's not this one, and all of you are going to have to decide how you feel about this one, it's going to need to be another one. So uh, I just put that out there. As a package, when you put all this together, I think everyone would agree it's a pretty major accomplishment for California. But um, again, there is a lot more work to do, and there are many remaining challenges and uncertainties. One of the first challenges is unfolding right now, and that is the selection of the new seven-member Delta Stewardship Council. I would argue that we need to avoid the kind of selection process that we sometimes see for boards and commissions where each industry or each stakeholder interest sort of gets a designated slot on a council or maybe each geographic region. Uh, if, if we go that route, uh, we're likely to end up with a council that's not very functional. I think we're going to need folks who are independent, who are competent, and are able to work together because this council has a pretty ambitious task before it. Within the next two years, it's got to come up with a comprehensive plan to achieve the co-equal goals in the Delta. That is a tall order. It's got to be a group that can work together, that can inspire the confidence and trust of the public, and get that very tough job done. Um, funding of the council is another challenge. Now, in the legislation last year, we were able to identify enough funding for the first year of the council's uh, uh, administration. But going forward, we've got to learn from the mistakes of CalFed, and I was, I was glad to hear from the Little Hoover Commission a, a little bit earlier. One of those obvious mistakes that everybody agrees on is they didn't have uh, the ability to fund themselves. We can't allow that to happen to the new Delta Stewardship Council, uh, but that was a little bit too politically hot for the legislature to include in the package last year. Uh, we're, we're not done on that issue, though. Uh, I'm going to be moving forward legislation to at least put in place a narrowly targeted fee to support the administration of the council uh, to do the work it has to do in the next few years. And we're going to need to direct the council to bring back a long-term financing plan, probably for approval of the legislature at some future date, so that we don't leave it financially stranded like we did uh, the Bay Delta Authority. Another challenge in the months ahead has to do with the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. And I assume many of you are familiar with BDCP, as we call it. This is a big, big deal. A lot of work has been going into BDCP over the last couple of years. It's a collaboration among state and federal agencies, uh, especially the water project operators in the Delta State Water Project and Central Valley Project, also some key stakeholders and regulatory agencies. And it is an attempt to both recover the key species in the Delta and also provide the environmental stability that will make it possible for the state and federal water projects to have endangered species uh, permits, uh, not take permits, but literally 50-year permits to allow them to operate uh, under, under certain assumptions going forward. Uh, it's never been done. A, a, it is an attempt to do an HCP and an NCCP, which is sort of the state equivalent of an HCCP, but a little more rigorous. And that has never been done uh, for an aquatic project like this. Uh, so it is ambitious. Uh, the NCCP standard is very high. Uh, the legislation also raises the bar for BDCP in several important ways. It requires a serious analysis of alternatives that are specified in the legislation, including different types and sizes of conveyance, different alignments, including through delta uh, solutions, and different operating assumptions. Basically, the legislation says that you can't just focus on huge facilities, a huge peripheral canal designed to return to full contract deliveries. 
which was pretty much what BDCP was doing for the last couple of years, quite honestly. Um, it's not clear that BDCP has yet gotten the message and embraced the new policy of reducing dependence on the delta and meaningfully incorporating uh, these new alternatives analyses. But it is essential that BDCP have this reality check that it comply with both the letter and the spirit of the legislation because there's a lot at stake. And I think many folks around the state uh, are counting on BDCP to succeed. BDCP also, very importantly, has to incorporate new public trust flow criteria that are being developed by the state water board over the next nine months and um, should, should be consistent with the new biological objectives that the legislation directs the Department of Fish and Game to develop over the course of this next year. Again, it's not quite clear in this respect that BDCP has gotten the message. It's not possible to be informed by public trust flow criteria that are going to be developed over the next nine months by the state board when you are pursuing a, a schedule that calls for a draft EIR at about the same time as those flow criteria will be released. And yet BDCP continues to assert this very unrealistic schedule that I would argue is driven almost entirely by the fact that this is the governor's final year in office. That's going to have to change for BDCP to be credible and effective and again to comply with the letter and the spirit of the legislation. Perhaps the most worrisome red flag for me about BDCP is that the key agencies who are attempting to build credibility and trust in this process, that are attempting to uh, inspire public confidence that this is a serious conservation plan that will recover the Delta's fisheries, are simultaneously litigating, lobbying, and otherwise attempting to invalidate current minimum protections for Delta smelt and salmon in the Delta. So BDCP is not only going to have to meet some very high standards that we've established in the legislation, it's also going to have to overcome these and other points of concern uh, to be successful. Another challenge that lies ahead is the in-stream flow criteria that I mentioned that the State Board is now uh, in the process of developing. This is very critical for the success of BDCP and was a very important part, quite frankly, of the entire negotiated compromise water package. Um, believe it or not, although we've asked the State Board at various times over the last 50 years to look at individual water quality objectives or maybe individual species requirement as, as part of a, a permit or a, a, an application that was pending before them, we've never asked them to step back and look at the entire Delta estuary and tell us what all of the public trust resources require in terms of flows for this estuary to be healthy. Uh, that is the question that we've asked, and it responds in, in some ways to a criticism of the BDCP process. A lot of folks looked at BDCP and said, well, they're, they're sort of starting by proposing this huge 20,000 CFS peripheral canal, but they haven't yet asked the question of how much water needs to stay in the system for healthy fisheries and how much water is surplus to those public trust needs that can be considered for export. So it's very significant that the legislation put that question back at the front end of the process and charge the State Water Board to ask it. Now I will tell you that not everyone wants that question to be asked. And I had a very interesting experience a couple weeks ago. The State Board had its first public workshop as it begins to develop these flow criteria. And you know the legislation is really quite clear in terms of what the board has been tasked with doing. It says that within nine months the State Board has to develop what clearly are going to have to be quantitative public trust flow criteria for a healthy delta estuary. And yet lots of water users and even some state board members seem pretty eager to reinterpret the legislation in that regard. Maybe they don't have to actually provide numbers for the flows. Maybe just some kind of narrative description. Maybe the deadline's too ambitious and doesn't really need to be met. Maybe it doesn't really uh, require us to look at inflows into the entire system, maybe we can just look at delta outflows. Maybe we can do an interpretive dance instead of providing actual public trust flow criteria. Um, now we all know that the State Board is not by constitution an agency that moves quickly or boldly on many things, let alone a big politically challenging issue like this. But that is exactly what they've been expressly mandated to do by the legislature. And I would argue that the stakes are too high for them to play rope-a-dope on this one. So it's going to be a key test, I think, for the State Board's credibility and viability as an institution 
and it's certainly critical to the success uh, of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Another major challenge going forward is going to be how we engage the federal government. Now, obviously, the state is just one part of the problems and solutions in the Delta. The federal government is a critical player. They're the largest water rights holder in the state. The Federal Endangered Species Act often dictates outcomes in the Delta. And yet we can't really force them to play on our terms. With a few notable exceptions, federal sovereign immunity prevents us from having direct authority over the federal government. So uh, the legislation from 2009, following the recommendations of the Delta Vision Strategic Plan, basically invites the federal government to follow our lead by utilizing the Coastal Zone Management Act. And what that act provides is that if you have a plan that is approved under the CZMA that, uh, and, and the Secretary of Commerce approves it, that federal agencies can be required to act consistently with it. And you have an appeal mechanism up to the Secretary of Commerce to ensure that consistency. It's not as strong or as binding as some of us might like, but it has worked in other situations. It's worked in terms of the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission, and it's worked in terms of uh, the BCDC, which is hard to say when you've been saying BDCP, uh, but uh, I think it's been a pretty good model. So uh, we're trying that approach, but I think that it's important to note that the legislation and ultimately the Delta Plan also establishes some important planning goals and objectives that could eventually be required of the federal government as conditions of their state water rights permits. And that is one of the areas where California has very clear authority to direct federal compliance. And so far, I have to say, I think the federal government has very, been very supportive of the direction that we've taken in the Delta legislation. Secretary Salazar wrote a letter at a, at a key time uh, in this process last fall, and he endorsed the policy framework that we laid out in this legislation. Uh, but the uh, 2010 election and certain Central Valley politics are adding a lot of pressure and uncertainty to the question of how the United States will engage on issues of Delta policy and governance in the coming year. If the federal government steps forward as a full partner in restoring the Delta ecosystem and better managing this estuary, then I think our highest hopes of achieving the co-equal goals in last year's water package um, can indeed be achieved. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of the challenges uh, that lie ahead to make this uh, successful in the Delta, and I hope nobody took me seriously at the beginning of my remarks when I said a miracle had happened and we'd solved all the problems. Uh, the Delta and, of course, the broader issues of water management in California that we tackled last year, they, they really are a big Gordian knot. And I'd like to think that our historic water package was the sort of Damocles that finally cut through it all, but the truth is this knot is going to take a lot more work. The legislature does deserve credit for setting in motion what should be a vast improvement in the status quo and for passing some reforms that I do believe will lead to some truly big game-changing outcomes for California water in the years ahead. But it's going to take a lot more work. A lot more work to bring back our uh, flagging fish populations to ensure sustainable and reliable water supplies and to bring California water policy into the 21st century. Cutting through this knot is going to take a sustained effort by all of us, all of us in this room, legislators, regulators, attorneys, and stakeholders, I think probably for years to come. But I would say that given the importance of the Delta and the significance of California water challenges, we really have no choice but to stick with it and do whatever it takes to get it right. And so with that, I think I've got a few minutes to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Hap, yeah. Jared, if the new state policy is to reduce dependence on the Delta, uh, do you think it's consistent with that to have a large new conveyance facility? Well. Uh, it's a good question, and it's one I think we need to struggle with. Um, some folks argue that uh, having a very large facility makes it possible to take advantage of windows of opportunity when fish are not in the system, and that that better enables you to pull back at critical times and not divert water when fish are in the system. That operational flexibility is even put forward by some folks that uh, are interested in this issue from the fisheries perspective. On the other hand, um, I think all of us know from the history of California that um, it, it's tough. When you build a facility capable of exporting at a certain capacity, folks are going to keep pushing to use all that capacity all the time. 
So I personally would argue that size matters in this case, that uh, it's going to be hard to establish public trust and confidence that, that a system will be operated in a fish-friendly way when it has the ca capacity to uh, be operated in a very unfriendly way going forward. And, uh, uh, you know, I think there are other reality checks that may well be uh, ahead for this system. When you listen to folks like Greg Gartrell at the Contra Costa Water District, he's done some very interesting analysis that suggests they can get 90% uh, of the water they need with a system that's a fourth the size of what they've been considering for the last two years. Um, so uh, cost will probably be a, a factor that also visits a little bit of reality on this process because we've seen some price tags associated with some of the bigger, particularly the surface uh, oriented uh, facilities that are astronomical. Um, so all of this, I think, is going to come into play, and uh, I, I don't frankly know how it's going to end up, but I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the size of the facility. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I did. So the question is, what cleanup legislation can we expect in 2010? I think the fee authority issue will be one. The water enforcement tools that came out literally in the final hours of the process as part of a, uh, a, a demand by my colleagues across the aisle, I think many of those tools that came out are going to be back on the table, and I'm hopeful that we will put them on the governor's desk. They're very, very important to uh, deciding if we're serious about protecting legal users of water from water theft. And then one other piece, there, there may be others, but the one other piece that I know about is um, for the bond, one of the more controversial pieces that frankly nobody knew was in it, uh, it got snuck in at the last minute, was a provision that would allow a joint powers authority uh, that includes private investors to receive public geo bond financing as part of a surface storage project. That's bad policy. It's never happened in the state of California. It's not something I ever would have approved of. Uh, and it's not something, frankly, that any of us really knew had been snuck in to the bond. Um, I intend to work on that issue and to make it very clear that that's not something that's going to be legal in the state of California to allow public, uh, public benefit geo bond money to go to uh, a private investor in that, in that manner. So those are the ones I know about. Yeah. Following up on that, uh, and by the way, that JPA is going on now at the Kern Water Bank, so I hope we can succeed on that. But if the bond measure were to fail, uh, and looking ahead to the next session of the legislature that will convene in 2011, is it realistic to expect that some of the things left on the committee room floor might be looked again at the legislature in a new gubernatorial administration? Well, there are a lot of things that could happen in a new administration, and uh, there's probably a, a big difference between <laughs> in the two most likely uh, candidates for. Uh, for governor from the two parties in terms of what might happen. Um, I, I do want to use that question as a chance to uh, explain to everyone that the policy reforms and the governance reforms that we put in pay place do not in any way depend on passage of the bond. Uh, they stand alone. Uh, at the same time, the success of some of the goals that we've established for the Delta and for water supply and ecosystem restoration would certainly benefit from the funding that the bond would provide, including over $2 billion for Delta restoration. We need that money at some point. Um, so uh, I don't know if that fully answers your question, Tony, but the policy and governance don't depend on the bond. They would benefit from the money, and uh, lots of interesting stuff could happen uh, from the next governor. Yeah. I think you're referring to the Delta Conservancy and you know, one of the goals that's been uh, established by Delta Vision and others who have looked at the ecosystem needs is probably the need to identify as much as 100,000 acres uh, of uh, interconnected habitat that needs to be restored. And you know, we've got 150 year investment in agriculture in the Delta. Uh, it's pretty important, uh, I think, to, to the Delta and to all of us. And uh, yet in many places, uh, as, as the uh, farming within those levees has caused land to subside sometimes as much as 20 feet or more below sea level. 
we know that it's not sustainable to continue farming in some of those places. Uh, so we're going to have to identify uh, areas that can be returned to habitat over time. It's no good to anybody if levees break and we create a new deep water uh, hole in the delta. That's not good habitat and it's certainly not good for agriculture. I think the hope is uh, maybe less through eminent domain and more through good long-term planning and cooperative collaboration with uh, local interests in the delta. We can uh, identify the areas that need to be returned to habitat, identify the priority areas that we need to keep in agriculture and make this work, but it's not 500,000 acres, which is I think the figure I heard you say. Yeah. Well, you know, this sort of gets us into the other stressors debate, and uh, certainly uh, everybody understands that there are, are hundreds, if not thousands, of cuts that are hurting the delta. But, uh, you, know, you know, the danger in looking too far afield at all of the myriad stressors on the delta ecosystem is that we lose sight of the really big items that the scientists have identified as the major culprits in the demise of the delta. And that, of course, is water exports, it's pollution and it's invasive species. It's not an exhaustive list, but the scientists tell us those are the big three. Um, certainly the ammonia from Sacramento's wastewater discharge would be pollution. That's part of the problem. And we ought to take it very seriously. Sacramento shouldn't get a free pass in that regard. Mm -hmm. Hi. We'll, we'll oh, leave are we there? Yeah. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Hi. We're going to give everybody a break, but we're going to make it a little shorter because we're running a little longer. So please, we'll, we're going to start back up again uh, with Rick Frank's session at in um, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10.55. <laughs>